Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first-time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first-time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey there. And again, we have a crowd, and it's not just Jason Rugg. Hello, Jason. Hello. Hello. Christian we got back my intro. Us, editor. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Bill Ebel coming to us from Tennessee. Hello, Bill. Hey, guys. And again, Jeff Kurtnacker all the way from California. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Uh, it's very exciting to have you guys on here. I actually just made my children uh, all learn the state capitals. And uh, so it's great to have people from different states. So I'm going to have them listen to this podcast and quiz them to see if they know each other <laughs> state's capitals. Hey, Josh, uh, you know, this time in Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say this time in quarantine and e-learning has really taught me how much my children aren't learning. So I have really <laughs> taken it upon myself to be proactive and teach them something. So <laughs> That's awesome. I'm happy that you're back with us as our moderator. Oh, thank you. Yes, it'll be short-lived because I'm about to hand over the reins to Bill. But before I do that, Christian. Yes. You have an update for us on the film. Sadly, I have nothing to update you with. <laughs> Other than I will tell you this one fun thing. Of course, there is always more. Our team just put together a very special D-Day video that we're sending to the town of Carenton to wish them a happy D-Day. Um, they All the things were closed this year, and they did ask me to make a statement about what Normandy meant to me. But I thought we could do a lot better than just my statement. So uh, we reached out to several of the veterans in our film and other ones that are friends of the film. We reached out to modern day service members and a lot of our team members. And we put together a video that Bill just shipped off to D Denny Vandenbrink, one of our cast members, uh, and Carenton. So that's super exciting. And we're going to have that play on our social media also for D-Day this year. So I'm super proud of that. Okay. But I don't have any updates for you because we just recorded the last podcast five minutes ago. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> has happened. Well, can you Decorate remind now. us uh, how this, the, this podcast and the last podcast came to be to have Bill and Jeff interview each other? Yeah, we were in a session where we were trying to give Jeff some feedback about his score. And I think we did tell him some positive things, but mostly it was like what we could ask him to fix. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in the middle of that, they had just listened to each other's podcast and said, oh, I have so many more questions for you. And so I said, well, let's do a podcast and you guys can ask each other questions. And here we are. Here we are. I would also like to make the connection between filmmaking and sales in terms of feedback. And in my world, you know, I have a lot of happy clients, but they're not always proactive in saying why they're happy. If you hear from them, it's usually, you know, like they need something done. Can you fix this? Whatever. And so, again, I feel like I can relate to <laughs> Jeff and Bill in the lack of positive feedback and overwhelmingly, seemingly negative feedback. So I, I feel your pain. Yeah, you're kind of in this like limbo state until they maybe they come back to you months or a year later and go, hey, we really liked what you did for us the first time. Like, oh, you did? <laughs> I had no idea. So I'm glad, I'm glad we're friends. <laughs> well, hey, Bill, uh, I know you had some questions for Jeff. So why don't you uh, take over from here? Yeah. So uh, I'll kind of do these in chronological order. But okay. uh, yeah. The, so how do you how did you get into music and then specifically how did you get into composing versus like performing or you know any of the other avenues that you could have gotten into? Yeah, um, you know I did the typical thing of piano lessons. Um, eventually, when I got into high school and college, I was really interested in music theory and composition, um, and I think that started um, because I. You know, did we lose him? Oh, I think he dropped out. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? We can now. You're back yep. with us. Oh, sorry. Our internet might be a little wonky. You're back. Okay. So, um, the you know, I was playing piano as a kid, and I, for whatever reason, the the, the language of music just resonated with me. Um, the the chords and melodies, I I just really enjoyed uh, music, and so when I discovered through music theory. 
and that I could express myself that way. Um, I just felt way more comfortable doing that than being on stage or somehow performing. There's just so much pressure in it. It's a different kind of pressure, but um, I just really wasn't cut out for that. And so I really fell in love with the, the composing part of it. Um, you know, someone, it's the same thing. Someone wants to be a writer versus an actor. Like I really like taking my time and getting the language right with, as I write the music um, versus being the one who actually then brings it to life. So if somebody, you know, is, is, you know, in college and loving music and kind of trying to figure out that path, what is that path for a composer? Do you get on as an assistant to somebody or how did you get to where you are now? Yeah, I don't think that um, there's really any right or wrong path. I think, unfortunately, I wish there was like you do this and you get this. But um, really, it's really um, important to be around where people are doing things you want to do. So I moved from Wisconsin out to California because they were making movies here. And um, and then I was around people who were writing music for movies and editing movies and being in movies. So um that's where I really started to meet more people and get more opportunities was being around those situations. But definitely if you can get an apprenticeship with a composer or if you can somehow um, be working in a recording studio, even as an intern, all that stuff, I think goes a a long, long way to meeting people and learning the craft. So what was some, what were some of your first jobs? Like when, when you started doing it, yeah, uh, yeah. Interestingly enough, I wanted to move to California to get into film and actually end up getting into video games, which was fine for me, but um, it was really interesting. So one of the first things I did was um, I was an arranger on the uh, a video game called Warcraft 3. And I did a lot of arranging, not the composing, but the arranging. And then they brought me back um, to work on World of Warcraft. And I made all the parts for the orchestra. So I did all the, they call it copy work, where I got all the pages right for everybody. And I did some arranging for that uh, as well. Okay. So when, you, when you're writing music for film or for a video game, how does that, how do you begin? Like, what, do you just noodle around on the piano? Do you, are there, um, like, like with editing, a lot of times I'll read the script and while I'm reading the script, I can kind of imagine the, the shots playing out. And then obviously you have to wait till you get the footage to see how that lines up and how it matches up. But yeah. with music, it seems like a completely magical, like I have no concept of how you even get started on a project. Well, I think it's a similar, I think, starting point where, you know, um, you get familiar with the material and then I kind of imagine just a more of an emotional tonality or sort of an idea of how this should maybe come across or help support this. Um, So, for instance, when Christian says, you know, it's, it's it's a World War II documentary, but it's a love story at its heart. Well, so now... Immediately, I feel like there should probably be some military, you know, uh, uh, you know, some sort of reference to military stuff, whether it's snare drums or brass or things like that. There should be some sweeping melodies because there is a love story component. Um, there's a lot of tension and conflict. So I'm, I'm just trying to think of like emotionally how it might start to t- take shape. But then really Christian comes in and says, um, okay, now let me refine this vision. As you read the script, I want you to think of this you know, as you think of Danny's theme as um, very poignant and, and very childlike because we first meet her when you know, we first kind of get her story from when she's five. And so I think those kinds of things become really important um, to sort I sort of get this broad stroke idea of emotional t- tones. Um, and then what's interesting, especially in video games, is sometimes they really want to flip it on its head. And, and we've all seen films where you think it should sound one way and what they've really done is, you know, gone a completely different way and somehow it works. Um, but it's always a starting point, at least for me, to just to kind of get some of those broad emotional strokes down. And from there, just on the piano, I try to start finding chords and there is a lot of noodling, but just trying try to find some chords or some, some sound, even if it's just a, a synth pad that feels that hollow expanse or something like that, where I, now I'm like, oh, that puts me in the story. Um, I try to get that emotional connection and refine it from there. 
So when you're, when you're doing a score, obviously there's piano, but there's also strings and horns and, you know, percussion and all that stuff. How have you played any of those instruments or how do you um, learn that part of it? Not really. I mean, I did play uh, trombone and piano and I play guitar and drums and I play a smattering of instruments, but not from orchestra standpoint. I definitely don't play as many as I should. Um, so that knowledge really comes from spending a lot of time with players, especially when I was in college. Um, the college I went to was very performance heavy. So there was a ton of people who were performance majors and I was always writing for different people's um, recitals. So I was writing for string ensembles and brass ensembles and choral arrangements. And so um, then I got to sit and hear them play and go, oh, wow, the violin sounds really squeaky in this range and it sounds really beautiful in this range. And you start to kind of get a feel for different instruments and what they can and can't do. Um, and sometimes I've written things that are just not very playable and the person will say, I don't know how to play this. And then they play it for me the way I wrote it. And I go, Oh yeah, that does sound janky. There's a break in the flute between two low keys. And if you try to put those two notes together in a slur, it's going to, it just doesn't flow very well. So you kind of either have to hide it or change the key. So you learn those things um, just by getting to know the players that are playing it and they give you some feedback and um, just knowing the instrument ranges, right? Knowing um, how things sound. If I really want something to sound urgent and sound, um, you know, very, I don't know, passionate in a way, um, I try to get up to the instrument's higher register. So it's almost this plea, just like you would with a voice, you're yelling, but it's almost this plea for, for help or a plea for, you know, something, a sorrowful, you know, whatever. So yeah. um, when you get up to an instrument's higher range, it really changes the, the timbre of the instrument. And if I want something rich and syrupy and velvety, you get down to the lower range and you, you just kind of learn those things as you as you listen to other people play and you go, oh, I love that sound or, oh, wow, the bassoon way up high sounds so cool. It sounds like something is really urgent. And then you start to try to use those in your own palette. That's super helpful because one of the things me and Christian have talked about is we've both learned on this project how to talk to you as a composer and, and give you feedback that's meaningful as opposed to, you know, we don't like this here or, you know, whatever. Uh, but to speak in terms of emotion and to go, we want to feel this here. What you just said about the instrumentation makes so much sense now, you know, with, with that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, once we kind of start to dial in some emotions, there's even room to play within that. It's like opening another secret compartment. And you, now that we're, now that we live in this house of this emotion, we can explore all the cupboards and see what all the, is in the closets of that emotional state. Um, and if we're still not hitting it, you know, then maybe we go out in the backyard and see what's out there, but you know, you <laughs> have plenty of options uh, or in the basement, you know, but there's plenty of options. Once you find an emotional foothold in yeah. this, in the, in the narrative, you kind of start to explore. And that's my favorite part actually is just starting to go, okay, this sounds crazy, but what if we had an acoustic guitar with like this ancient, loot liar thing you know and kind of have yeah. this otherworldly sound i really start like exploring those tonalities well and that was one of our favorite parts of the process uh was you know it, initially we kind of had this score that was very similar and we were you know obviously we had a such a shortened time frame we were just trying to get something out the door oh we i didn't really notice that but yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but then when we went back after we went to Normandy that first year and said, okay, now we have time to play with this. You came back with some great little pieces that I'm hoping you will give us a little list, a taste of for yeah. like uh, the little boy hiding the eggs or, you know, taking oh, the eggs yeah. guy and uh, Henri Laguerre's sister that, you know, those two pieces just stick out in my mind as ones that when me and uh, Christian heard it for the first time, we're like, Oh my gosh, this is like, we're in a whole nother world now. And then you've done that multiple times since then, but that was kind of our first taste of, Oh wait, we're moving away from this, you know, military love story type score. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about that on the last podcast. Um, just, with when Christian and I were talking about the score, but having those opportunities to add some 
some humor, right? Some yeah, levity yeah. to it, just so it's not this, because it is such a heavy story and it's beautifully told and, and so heartfelt. But to have these moments of of kind of a bright ray of sunshine is really fun. So um, with the um, like the story where um, the recounting the eggs and the, the colonel hiding the eggs, um, we kind of went to this. You guys hear that? Yep. Kind of went to this um, almost little jazzy thing. It was kind of this uh, <laughs> this kind of little bouncy. Right. Just kind of a, a different feel to it. And I had pizzicato strings, and they're kind of plucking away, and just was kind of bouncy and kind of fun. And you played the whole thing. People said last time they <laughs> wanted to hear more music. Sure, sure. So go like this. Something like that. Kinda, <laughs> I love it so much because it really changed the whole, like it really picked up. And that second act, we really, you know, we wanted it, or maybe it was the third act, you know, just we had gone through all this really tough, hard stuff and we wanted there to be some levity and that music really just did it there. It was great. Yeah. And the fun part was right after the, we hit that little, uh, 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 uh what is it? And then it goes right into this, this, uh, this kind of. Yeah. <laughs> this little walking bass. <laughs> and so it kind of ends up this walking bass. So right when that piano hits, we still kind of live in the jazz world for this other story that comes in about uh, Henry Gore's sister. And it, it was yeah. kind of just a cool, a yeah. cool transition to make that happen. Can you play us two other things? Can you play <laughs> play the uh, stealing the eggs theme? So that's a Jean-Marie Boucherie as a boy stealing his father's eggs and giving them to a GI. Uh, can you oh, play that's a little? That's what we just did. Oh, they went right into that? No, that that's, uh, that's uh, uh, that. That. Oh, that is the egg one. Yeah, yeah. That is. that's the the kernel in the eggs. Yeah, yeah, I don't know where I was for that moment. <laughs> okay, so how about the parachute theme? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> so, if you guys didn't hear this before, we identified a parachute theme that Jeff didn't even know he had. <laughs> it's never been a parachute theme, but it was just kind of this. Uh... The parachutes are like drifting down. kind of this this feeling of floaty but it's yeah. funny thing is there isn't a whole lot to it again it's that's what we talk about when we find like a, a house to live in emotionally yeah. I'm not really saying a whole lot other than just sort of breathing this sort of like misty musty breath upon the story really I'm not doing a whole lot other than just giving it a little bit of emotional darkness um, as in it's it works because you see these guys floating down from the sky and it's kind of yeah. nice but there isn't a big melody there you're not going to walk away whistling anything um, like it's a small world it's just a little chord change and just those two chords are just kind of enough to to put you oh, in a yeah. world. Oh, you did uh, something really interesting during the Michel de Valivier, the scene where he got shot in, his, in the back five times. And I remember saying we needed that to be a little bit more, um, you know, scary, sort of yeah. wary. Uh, tell us about that piece and how that came about. So originally, I kind of just let that story play out. And I didn't, I didn't come in until the end, until he talks about being shot. But yeah, Christian... And Bill, you guys said you really wanted something that felt a little more tense. We wanted to feel the yeah. tension. Is he's, he's telling the story about, um, you know, the Germans or was well, the Americans, right? Uh, but the Americans thought maybe the French were Germans. So there was this tense standoff, and they're at the house, and it was this. And as he's telling the story, we want to feel that tension, and that actually was a little difficult for me because um, I wasn't quite sure how to complement the story, but also have it be tense because. 
I couldn't be too heavy handed. Um, and so what I ended up doing was actually just kind of focusing on one pizzicato string note that just kind of keeps drilling on a beat. And it's just sort of just this. But then I just started surrounding it with like, you know, this just these kind of other notes that start well, and then the harp comes in. The harp kind of does this. And then you're back to just that drilling. Yeah. One note. So that just actually what I discovered is that kind of a less is more approach. Just that one note beating while he's telling a story, it kind of makes you already go, oh, w what's happening here? And, and his story's almost filling in the gaps that I'm leaving in a way. And I played it really actually a little heavier initially. And then Christian, you were like, hey, can we strip? A, it's just a little too busy. And that was a great feedback because when I stripped it out, what I've discovered was, oh man, just just having that little pulse there throughout the story and then filling it at times with these other little kind of tense chords, um, it really just sort of it was a salt that really sort of draw drew out that emotion if he was telling that he was telling it. I thought it worked well. Yeah, me too. It was perfect. Do you think you could play us out with playing our main Sure. Song. So this came early on actually from one of the trailers. Um, and I really, I really love this, this theme I've come to sort of associate in the film. I use it to, and to, with, uh, France, you know, Normandy's love and dedication for the Americans. And when they talk about what it means to them and how much, um, the efforts that they go to, to s still commemorate and celebrate D-Day, um, this has kind of become that love theme. So uh, I'll play it for you. Awesome. The funny thing is, it's a little tidbit, maybe most people don't care, but um, <laughs> usually when you write a melody, um, it comes to some sort of resolution. And I wrote this, it actually never really resolves. I put a little chord there at the end, but in the film, it always sort of ends up hanging on. I never, because I think it's an ongoing, I don't know that I actually consciously did this, <laughs> but it felt like an ongoing relationship. And so we always kind of end with this. And then it usually goes into something else, you know, that kind of takes over. But I realized when I was making the music for this, I don't, I don't have like an ending for it. It just kind of stays on that unresolved chord. And then, you know, I ended it. But um, in the film, there's a lot of kind of just hanging out there, which I think is kind of cool because yeah. that relationship has so much more to give. That's awesome. It is awesome. Thank you, Jeff, for lending your talents to our film. We are just so honored to have you. Oh, thanks. It's, uh, it's awesome for me to do it. It's a <laughs> pleasure for me to be here talking about it. <laughs> so, Josh, did you learn something? Are you even still here? I think he's frozen. <laughs> he is frozen. Jason, you get... perfectly frozen, so he looks super <laughs> interested in everything. <laughs> Jason, you get to, to take us out, I guess. Yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you for listening to Documentary First, um, the podcast where we believe everyone has a story to tell, and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. <laughs>